Well, I want you to take your Bible, if you would, tonight and turn to the book of 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and let's stand together for the scripture reading tonight as we turn to 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 12. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 12. Continue to pray for Brother Michael. I'm so glad he's here tonight. Brother Michael, we're praying for you and for the right diagnosis and treatments as well as Brother Gary Williams, who's here tonight also. We're praying for you, Brother Williams, and let's just continue to remember these who have physical needs uh, as we pray along the way. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, we're going to read down through uh, verse number 15. And so follow along with me as we read together, and we'll read actually down through verse 16. Verse 12, no man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him." Let us pray. Father, as we see the indicators of salvation in the book of 1 John, we see that one such indicator is the indwelling love that comes from you and that is evidenced to other believers. And I pray that that love would be fervent at the Lancaster Baptist Church, that our love for you and that our love for one another, our love for this lost and dying world, Uh, We ask that it would increase because of our time tonight. Thank you for this time to open your word, bless the song we're about to hear, and then the preaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you were to observe the signage along the hallway to the West Wing, you'd find our church purpose, you'd find our church ministry path, our core values, and along that hallway, you would find the mission of the church, loving God, growing together, and serving others. Let's say that together, shall we? Loving God, growing together, and serving others. Loving God. This is an area of the Christian life where each and every one of us need to grow even tonight. The Apostle Paul said that I may know him, uh, that I may know the Lord, and that I may know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. It was his passion to know the Lord. Job once uttered in Job 23 and verse 3, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. No doubt during the whirlwinds of life, we want to know God in a greater way. We want to speak our burdens to him and hear his answers to us, knowing God. Someone wrote, Left to themselves, men arrive at a false knowledge of God. A knowledge that only begets fear and bondage and which repels men rather than draws them unto him. However, the glorious central fact of Christianity is that God has made a full and final revelation of himself, which he has made to be understandable, accessible, desirable, and to the simplest that fear him. He has done so in his Son, the Lord Jesus through whom he made the worlds, and who, having humbled himself to take, him, take, take on him our flesh and blood, and by himself to purge our sins, has sat down at the right hand of the Father. God has made himself manifest to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Mark 12 and verse 30, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. To know God, to make him known. We think of this fundamental purpose, to know God, to love God, and to love others. And in 1 John, we find a synopsis, really, of the purpose of the Christian life, to know him, to love him, to be the expression of his love before a lost and dying world. And so I speak tonight on the subject, the expression of the love of God that the world may see God through Christ, through his word, and through his church. For the Bible says in Matthew 5, 8, blessed 
blessed are they. And the Bible speaks of the blessing of seeing God. And we want to be a people that are blessed tonight through seeing the Lord Jesus high and lifted up and through then uh, reverencing him and through testifying for him in our lifetime. Now notice tonight in verse 12 what our text says. No man hath seen God at any time. Now, isn't it strange that the first point of this message would be the revelation of God, but we would read that phrase first. No man hath seen God at any time. And so let's think about the revelation of God. Brother Paul Choi brought a fantastic lesson yesterday in our soul winning training, and I'm so glad we're back to training one and training two class and seeing soul winners partner up and go out thrills my heart. That's the purpose of the ministry. And he talked about the cosmological argument. He talked about the uncaused cause and how we can help, a, help an atheist to realize that all of this wouldn't be here had there not been uh, a creator, had there not been a God that, uh, that brought it into existence. It was a great time of just concentrating and thinking about how God has revealed himself through his creation. But here we see in this verse that no man hath seen God at any time. Matthew 5, 8 on the other hand says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall, what does it say? See God. And so sometimes you'll come to these places in scripture, you go, wait a minute, this verse says we'll see God. This verse says no one will see God. And so we begin to recognize that God is seen and known through the manifestation of his creation, through the revelation of his word and through the revelation of his son. No one has ever seen God, the father in the physical sense. God the Father has never been seen, yet he has revealed himself in human flesh. This is why Jesus came to the earth. I draw your attention to John chapter 1. If you turn there just for a moment, John chapter 1, keep your finger there in 1 John, and let's just refresh our memory for just a moment uh, from John chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 14, a very familiar verse, then we'll look at verse 18 as well. John chapter 1 and verse 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is the revelation of God through his son, Jesus Christ. The word, the eternally preexistent word was made flesh. By the way, Jesus did not begin his existence in Bethlehem's manger. He took the form of man there, but he is eternal God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father. This is the manifestation of Christ. Notice verse 18, it says, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So Jesus is the manifestation, the visible manifestation of God to us. Colossians 2 and verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. By the way, isn't that a wonderful truth? In him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily bodily. And what a blessing that is. And what a tragedy that so many cults today deny the deity of Jesus Christ when it is so clearly taught in the scriptures. That in him, Jesus, when you see the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches, you have seen God manifest in the flesh. Hebrews 1. Would you turn there for a moment? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. I want you to see this. I want our Bible college students to see it. I want our high school students to see it. Our children to see that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Now notice Hebrews 1 and verse 3 as it speaks about Christ. And it says these words, who, speaking of Jesus, being the brightness of his glory, speaking of God, and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high jesus then is the express image of his person so on one hand the bible says no man hath seen god at any time and yet we know that jesus came to be the express image of the person of God. The express image of his person here in this passage speaks of the character. It speaks of the exact image. Uh, it speaks of a marked a likeness or a precise reproduction. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. John chapter 14 and verse 7 speaks of it this way. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, 
and it sufficeth us. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou, Show us the Father? Ladies and gentlemen, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know God, because he is God in the flesh. Now, no man hath seen God, and yet he has revealed himself to us through nature, through his word, and most of all, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look and consider this, John Barnes wrote in his commentary, the statement seems to be made here in order to introduce a remark to show in what way we may know that we have true knowledge of God. The idea is he has never indeed been seen by mortal eyes. We are not then to expect to become acquainted with what he is in that way. Nevertheless, he has revealed himself through his son. Jesus did not come to make God's love possible but to make God's love visible. And so we thank God that he so loved the world, but that his son Jesus is visibly showing to us the love and the attributes of God, the heavenly father. I once read about a young father who wanted some alone time uh, on his uh, easy chair at home. He was reading a magazine, and, and his daughter kept bothering him. Her name was Vanessa. She wanted to play. And, and uh, finally, he tore out a page of the magazine that he was reading. And, and uh, on that particular magazine page, there was a map of the world. And he tore it into a whole bunch of different pieces. And he gave it to his daughter and said, go, put this together. Pretend it's a puzzle and put this together. And he thought that would take her maybe a few hours or whatever, and, and he could have his quiet time on his chair chair there. And, and so Vanessa, uh, she, she took those pieces of paper. And yet after just a few minutes, she came back. She handed to her father the map of the world, all perfectly pieced right back together. And the father was astonished. And he said, Vanessa, how did you get this map of the world so perfectly pieced back together? She said, oh, daddy, it was so simple. On the other side of the paper was a picture of Jesus and when I put Jesus back like he belonged, the world just came back together automatically. You know, sometimes we don't understand all of the craziness of this world, but I'm so glad that we know the revelation of God through our Lord Jesus Christ and that he gives us the perspective that we need in times like these. Jesus is God revealed in the flesh. And so we understand that when it says no man hath seen God at any time, that we have a revelation and a knowledge of God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice, secondly, the believer reflects God's indwelling. Not only do we know God through Christ, but we are to be the expression of God's love in this generation as we have received his son. Notice what it says here in verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Simply stated, it is God's design that people who are around Bible-believing Christians, people who are amongst the church and the believers, should have opportunity to see God in us, to experience the love of God through us. People cannot see God, but they can see God's children revealing him in their love one for another. And this is God's design. It is God's design that the church weeps with those who weep and rejoices with those who rejoice and that through the love that we show to one another, there is a testament, testament to the fact that God is present among us. His love is reflected then in our love one for another. And the Bible speaks of this. It says, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us. The word dwelleth here speaks of remaining and abiding. He's with us. And the fact that we love one another and express this love is a testimony to God with us. And oh, it's a blessing when trials come and sickness and, and the challenges that we face to be able to pray for one another and encourage one another and to be the hands of God and the feet of God and the mouth of God and the testament to the love of God. John chapter 13. I want you to turn there quickly if you would. John chapter 13 and verse 34. Let's hear those pages just turning just a little bit tonight. John 13, 34. Let's go back to John's gospel and, and see what is mentioned here in regard to this matter of the revelation of God's love. John 13, 34 says it this way. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. 
By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And by the way, that ought to start in your marriage, and that ought to start teenagers with you loving your parents, honoring your parents. It ought to start with each one loving the other here. Listen, there ought never to be a time, ever, there not, ought not ever to be a time when pastor couldn't say, brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so, come over here. I need you to help this young man. He needs to be saved. You two come and help. You ought, to, you ought to be right with every member of the church at any given moment. Don't ever let something come between you and the Savior or you and another member of the church. And if there's something like that, go to them and make it right because, hey, we have got to be able to serve God at all times. Listen, there's an army over in Ukraine and they're fighting a powerful fight the Russian army. They don't have time to bicker. They don't have time to be upset with each other. They don't have time to hold a grudge. They have a common enemy, and it is Vladimir Putin, and they've got to fight against the armies of the Russian, uh, of Russia. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a common enemy, and it is Satan, and we need to be ready to fight against Satan at any moment of time. And this is why God wants his church to be intensely in love with God and in love with one another. John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I remember at Brother Jack Harper's funeral, I mentioned this, and over the years I've had a lot of men who've, who've come to me and say, hey, if we can help you, let us know, and we're for you. And some of those men have been involved in various ministries of care and watch care and such, and it's been a blessing. But I've pastored long enough to have men who've said to me, Listen, if I can ever help you, let me know. And they can't even help by just even attending church half the time, much less being right there to save your whole life. Kind of hard to save your whole life if you're not there. Amen. <laughs> I mean, you got you to start with A before you get to Z. Somebody help me here. Amen. And Brother Harper, I was speaking about it this at his funeral, and Brother Harper had said to me on more than one occasion, he was a, an Army veteran and a and a helicopter uh, mechanic and, and uh, served in Korea. We had a lot in common that way. And more than one time he said to me, now preacher, you know I'd take a bullet for you. And you know he was one of those men, I never doubted that. I never doubted that. And by the way, I never doubted his love for me and I don't think he ever doubted my love for him. There are many things that you may say, I could not do this, I could not do that, but one thing you can do and be is a loving Christian. You say, well, I, I don't think someone knows that I really do love or that I do care. Listen, just keep loving them. Just keep meeting needs. Just keep praying for them. Just keep being their friend because Jesus has commanded us to love one another. Yeah, but they don't love me back or they don't seem to sense it or whatever they look at. God just says, look at, I want you to be the manifestation of my love. The love that we display for others, especially for our fellow believers, reflects that Jesus is in us. It opens opportunities to witness. It shows the evidence of God abiding with us. And so we see his love is reflected by our love one for another. And it ought to be that the unsaved world looks at a congregation like this and says, they've got something I don't have. What's the source of that? And through our testimony, we can reveal to them the source of that is God. Look at how can people from 30 or 40 different nations get together in this place on a Sunday morning and sing and smile and worship and love the preaching. It's because we have been born again by the Spirit of the living God, and Jesus is our Savior. The believer reveals, uh, uh, the, the believer reflects the indwelling of God, and, and we see that his love is reflected by our love one for another. And by the way, his love is completed through us. It's, it's continuing through us. Notice in verse 12, it says, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. It is to say that he, it is completed through us, and, and what is yet wanting uh, in order to, uh, to render a thing full is to be found perfect. It's the end goal, you might say, that God loved us through his son Jesus, and now we are loving one another and loving this world, and that is the will of God, that the love of God's people would fulfill and bring an end to the Great Commission. This is the will of God. And listen, every time we support a missionary or pass out a gospel tract or help someone in Jesus' name, it's the furtherance 
It's the fulfillment of the love of God. It's the perfection of the love of God. John 15 speaks of this. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. There, there is a revelation of God. No man has seen God, but you can see him at Lancaster Baptist Church. You can see him in the bus ministry. You can see him in the missionaries. You can see him when you're out door knocking and inviting people to the Easter program and when the choir is singing, blessed be the name, and when someone's forgiving and loving and giving and caring. Listen, God should be seen in the local New Testament church. Amen. And the revelation of God is through his son and his son in us. Then the revelation of God is through us, the local New Testament church. I thank God for that revelation, don't you? Because all of us have experienced it. All of us have been the benefactors of the love of God through the church. And we want to be the continuation of that. But notice, secondly, not only the revelation of God does John speak of, but then we see the reliability of the Spirit. The reliability of the Spirit. Now come to verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. Now, we are receiving in the book of 1 John confidence, assurance. Not false assurance, not false confidence. Based on scriptural evidences, we are receiving knowledge that we can be assured and know that we are the children of God. One of those I spoke of just a moment ago by the fact that you love people that you normally would not love is an evidence that God is in you. But another evidence is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that does not have to be something spooky or something manifested with particular uh, expression, but it is something that is real in the life of a believer. It's something and someone that every teenager should get to know and understand and sense the leading of and the convicting of this third person of the Godhead, the person of the Holy Spirit, the one whom the Scripture says, quench not the Holy Spirit, grieve not the Holy Spirit. This morning I spoke of the husband and wife relationship, and I spoke about the fact that sometimes a husband can quench the spirit of his wife, and he has to run to the flower shop, and the florist has to help him determine how big of a bouquet to get, depending upon how much he quenched his wife. And just as a wife can be quenched because she's a person that feels the Spirit of God that lives within us, has a personality, he can be quenched by the sin and by the neglect that we show to him. And so we see here in verse 13 that we know that we dwell in him because he hath given us his Spirit. Now, we'll not spend an amazing amount of time on this, but turn quickly to Ephesians chapter 1. Because all of you know that we're born again by the Spirit of God. We all understand that the Spirit of the living God takes up residence in our life when we're saved. But let's get a quick foundation for that. Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 1.13. And it's okay to underline verses like this. It's okay to have something in the back of your Bible that speaks of the Godhead and to write verses pertaining to the various persons of the Godhead, because oftentimes the Trinity is challenged by the cults today. And here we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, in whom ye also trusted, speaking of Jesus, after that ye heard the word of truth, no one saved without hearing the Bible, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, all right, so we've established that the Holy Spirit's entrance and ministry into our life is precipitated by putting faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So after this is done, after you believe, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Romans chapter 9 and verse 7 says, if you have not the Spirit, you are none of his. So the Holy Spirit's indwelling of the believer is something that takes place at the moment of our salvation. And, and we see that we can know that we dwell in him by the presence of his spirit within us. Now, there are times in the life of a believer when the presence of the Holy Spirit of God is very acutely known. And by the way, that should be the normal Christian life. 
The Bible says, does it not? Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Bible tells us to sing in the spirit. The Bible tells us that we're not to quench the spirit. We're not to grieve the spirit. The Bible tells us to pray in the spirit. Walking in the awareness and the fullness of the Holy Spirit should be the normal Christian life. But sometimes in our life, we can fail to yield to the Spirit, to listen to the Spirit, to think of the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. And it is during those times, and sometimes because the Spirit is convicting and we quench the Spirit, our conscience becomes defiled, and we're not listening to the Holy Spirit like we did at one time prior. I think there's no other time when someone is more alive to the Holy Spirit than right after they first get saved. How many of you know what I'm talking about? My mother used to say to me, Paul, the night you prayed to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, I remember hugging you as you were going to your bedroom, and she said, you had the face of an angel. And I often think that probably was the last time I ever had that face, but thank God I had that face, <laughs> the face of an angel, she said. The moment you're first saved... The Spirit of God has indwelt you. There's no sin between you and the Savior. It's just as pure as it possibly can be. There's this awareness that God is in you. And it's an assuring thing to know. It's an assurance that comes. The Spirit of God is in me. And through the course of your Christian life, though you may have times when you are not listening to the Spirit as intently, though you may have times when you have allowed sin uh, into your life, though you have times when you are not as close to God, if there is a wrestling within your spirit, a convicting within your spirit, if there is a pulling back, pulling you back to the Word of God, if there is with the, even a teenager that shows signs of, of rebellion, so long as there is a conviction for that rebellion, a knowledge that what they're doing is wrong, that, that would be the evidence of God in them. It is those who can sin without conviction, those who can live without ever even being sensitive to the Spirit or ever having been led to witness or to give or to care or to love. Those who have no love and have no care that they have no love. That absent relationship with the Holy Spirit should be worrisome. It is not that someone who is saved will never sin. It is not that they will always be acutely aware and obedient to the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. But the Bible says here that we know that he dwells in us because he's given us his spirit. In other words, you cannot possess the Holy Spirit of God and not know it. Amen. Even someone who's never discipled never had the chance to properly get under the preaching of the Word of God. If they were truly saved, there's going to be a longing within them to want to know more about this Jesus. And we see the reliability of the Holy Spirit. We see the assurance that He gives. The fact that you are at times convicted, the fact that you are sometimes burdened, that's a good thing. Moms and dads, when we have teenagers that are in a life of sin and they could care less, that's a big warning signal about their salvation. Yes, there is a point of repentance when someone is saved. Uh, they, it, they may not use the word repent. They may confess their sin. They may say, Lord, I, I confess to you that I'm a sinner, but there's a spirit of repentance when someone is saved. And there will also be, in the spirit-filled believer, a life that is evidenced by a spirit of repentance the Spirit of God convicting them, and they're confessing, 1 John 1, 9, their sin. They're turning away from that sin. If someone who says they're saved announces that they're living an ungodly lifestyle and there's never a turning from it, never a convicting of it, then there is not going to be a witness within them that they are really saved. But the Bible says if the Holy Spirit is in us, then we know that we dwell in Him because He's given us the Holy Spirit of God. So, when you come under conviction, don't say, I'm tired of that church for a guilt trip. You don't have a pastor who tries to get you to do right by making you feel guilty. Not one time during our preaching on stewardship did you ever have a message that was kind of to lay a guilt trip on you. It was to share a burden, to teach biblical principles, and to pray that the Holy Spirit would show you what to do. Let me tell you something. When you feel convicted about doing something for God, don't begrudge that conviction. Conviction is the gift. Conviction is the evidence of the Holy Spirit in you. And when your life is not lived according to the principles of the Word of God, we should be convicted, and that's the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in us. 
and that he's working within us and it's a, pr a, a true present from God. Notice the testament of the Spirit in verse 14. It says, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You see, the Holy Spirit is always affirming to us who Jesus is. And John says, we have seen and we do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Uh, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, I believe the blood of Jesus Christ was efficacy for the sins of the entire world. I know the entire world does not get saved, but I'm telling you what, that whosoever will may come and drink freely. Now, the testament of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit always testifies of Christ. John 16, verse 13, if you'd like to turn to John 16 tonight. And notice what it says here. It says, John 16, 13, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. The, the Holy Spirit indwells us, he convicts us, he guides us. Uh, we are aware of his presence, sometimes more acutely than others, but we know his presence is with us. And the Holy Spirit's ministry within us is that our word and our life would exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, when somebody gets saved through our preaching, through our soul winning, when someone is blessed through our singing, we just simply say, praise God, glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just the Holy Spirit using me. I'm just nothing but a bucket of dirt. Amen. Yep. Right? Amen. And God saved me and the Spirit of God lives within me. So if there's anything good that happened through me, it's because the Holy Spirit did it through me. And the Holy Spirit uses us to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John is showing us that, that there is the revelation of God. No one has seen him, but everybody can know him through Jesus Christ. And, and that is made possible because of the reliability of the Holy Spirit who physically, literally dwells within our body. What? No, you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we understand that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and that our ministry through the Holy Spirit is to exalt and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ who is the Savior of the world. Now, think of this tonight. God has been revealed to us through his Son, Jesus Christ, and if you are saved, you have believed on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Personally, you have turned to Christ as your Savior. You have seen then the revelation of God through his word. How many of you are thankful for that? You, you know, no one's going to come up to you and say, I saw God. I saw him. Face to face, eye to eye, I saw God. No one has seen God. But if you're saved, you know God <laughs> through Jesus Christ. So we see the revelation of God through Jesus Christ, the reliability of the Holy Spirit's work within us during our sojourn on this earth. He's guiding us to know Christ, to witness for Christ. But let's notice thirdly now the response of the believer. What is my response to knowing God and being filled with his spirit? How many of you would think that should change some stuff? <laughs> if you know God and his spirit indwells within you, that's not to say that a teenager won't go through a little period time to time of difficulty, questions, rebellion. There's going to be all those ups and downs in people's lives. But ultimately, the presence of God and his spirit in someone's life should make all the difference. What does the difference look like? Well, we could preach on that all night, but let's notice what it says in verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Let's just make this very simple. One of the main evidences of your knowing God and his spirit within you is that you're going to confess that you know the Lord Jesus Christ is Savior. Pretty simple, isn't it? But one of the great, great responses of a saved person is that they just let it be known that they're saved. Now let's just take this apart just a little bit. Whosoever shall confess. Our confession is the outward testimony of the inner work of Christ. And confession can take place in many ways, but let's study this just a little more. Uh, this word, homologesi, it indicates a decisive moment of confession. Jesus said, Whosoever will confess me before men, him will I confess before the Father which is in heaven. 
we ask people when they are baptized. And perhaps we should even take it and make it a little more thorough. Normally folks are so nervous we simply ask them, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And they are at that moment to profess, yes sir, I have, I have accepted. And baptism is an opportunity for someone to confess publicly that they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, 9, we have the confession or the admission of the fact that we are a sinner. But here, it is a declaration. So the word confession in this verse speaks of the fact that someone that is truly saved, someone that has the Holy Spirit of God in them, they are not going to hesitate to declare that they have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes new Christians don't know exactly how to say it. I understand that. You ever been around a new believer who starts trying to say how they got saved and they start with like their dad's surgery 18 years ago and you're like, what? <laughs> and then they go to this and then they go to this and then finally they're like, and that's because and all that. And then finally I realized and I heard from the word of God that I was a sinner and I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior. And I'm so glad I did. And you're like, oh good. I'm glad we got to that part because I wasn't sure where all that was. Sometimes a new Christian doesn't articulate it, but give them props for trying to. That's better than the longtime church member who, if you went out to Lockheed, no one would even know he's saved. Remember Brother Bill Weibel, one of the real pillars of our church for so many years. Bill Weibel, on one occasion, was going to be transferred to Georgia, Lockheed. The work just ran out for him. We were running about 100. I remember thinking, man, Brother Weibel, I sure hope he doesn't go, and he's such a blessing, and and, and I said, Brother Weibel, and I was just, boy, I was, I was definitely young enough to be his, his son in the flesh, and, and I didn't really know how to give him a lot of counsel. I said, Brother Weibel, I sure hope you'll pray about that and just do whatever God wants you to do. And I remember he came to me one day, and he said, Pastor, he said, um, I told my company, he said, there was an opening for janitorial. He said, now, as a manufacturing engineer, I made a lot more money but I told him, I'll go ahead and be a janitor the next few years so that I could stay here in my church. That's the type of decision, spiritually speaking, that make a great church. And by the way, a great Christian too. And Brother, Brother Weibel on one occasion said to me, he said, would you like to come and see where I work and, and uh, just look around and, and see some of, the, some of the planes we've made and some of this and that? And I said, sure, Brother Bill. And I remember walking with him. He was thankful that I was there, and he'd walk up to a group of men. He'd say, fellas, come over here. This is my pastor. This is the man that preaches to me on Sunday. I've told you about him, to come hear him. He preaches about Christ. He said that over and over again. He didn't, he didn't walk by some of the men that he worked with and say, hi, this is Brother from the church. No, this is my pastor. He preaches about Jesus. You ought to come hear him sometime. He wasn't ashamed, wasn't ashamed of his church, his pastor, but most of all, he wasn't ashamed of his Savior. Amen. You college students, never be ashamed of being a God-called child of God, Amen. a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You teenagers, never be ashamed. If you're truly saved, you ought never to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. A true convert will confess I was preaching this past Wednesday morning. I preached at 9 in the morning and Wednesday night at 7 for a meeting called the Capital Connection. It's a pastor's fellowship that meets in Washington, D.C., and then the pastors go and visit their elected officials. And, and uh, we sometimes will take a Bible or sometimes I've done Bible studies and prayer and just, uh, just to try to encourage godliness in their lives. And uh, it's been a good ministry. In fact, this was the 10th anniversary of that particular ministry. I think I've got a couple pictures of this week's uh, meeting. And uh, to your left there, you've got uh, Congressman Kevin McCarthy. One of, the, one of the joys of my ministry was having Brother Mike Garcia, our newly elected congressman, give his testimony to potentially the soon uh, Speaker of the House, Lord willing. Uh, Bye-bye, Nancy. That'll be a sweet day in my life. I just... That's not in the notes. It just came out. Please forgive me. <laughs> and I chose as my text Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And I just spoke to our two congressmen about lean not under your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Let him direct your path. Look at 
uh, it was a joy to hear Mike Garcia say, well, you know, I was a Catholic. I heard, I heard pastor share the gospel. I heard the message and, and uh, uh, Mr. Rasmussen took me to a room and I prayed and it was a joy to hear him confessing Jesus to the senior ranking member of his party. I had the privilege of um, spending some time with Jim Jordan. He's a congressman from Ohio. You probably know the guy because he never wears a coat. You, you just love him. You'd, you'd love it if we did that right here at Lancaster Baptist, some of you. It'd, it'd be fine with me. If, if you had half the vim and vigor and testimony of this guy, that'd be fine with me. But uh, what a patriot. And he began to share his testimony. And uh, we had, had a large group of folks there in the room. We were having kind of a lunch meeting. I think it's not good quality, but I just wanted to hear him. And he talks fast, telling about how he got saved. To the Lord. And because Gene Graham took the time to share the gospel with my dad, yeah. my dad then shared it with my mom, and his kids, and his brothers, and his sister, and all our family. And one guy, giving the good news to a guy who happened to work beside him, yeah. made a difference for a bunch of country folk hillbillies from Western Ohio. Amen. And you all know that story. And Kathy talked about the, the difference. She had a meeting where he's a young person hearing the gospel message. So thank you for doing that. Our charge is real simple, real basic. Paul told it to Timothy, my favorite scripture verse, 2 Timothy 4, 7. Paul's the old guy giving advice to the young guy. And what does he say? Fight the fight, finish the course, keep the faith. Fight the fight, finish the course, keep the faith. Amen? Amen. You know how much it blessed my heart to hear about 30 different congressional leaders stand before a group of pastors and tell us how they got saved? Amen. And you pray for them. Amen. But I'm telling you that if someone is truly saved, they're going to confess it. They're not going to be ashamed to tell others that they're saved. They're not going to be ashamed to tell the waitress, to tell the barber, to tell the friend at work, the person in the, in the uh, commuter van. The evidence is found in confession. Verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is, in the Son of, is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Oh, so many times the political way would be to say, well, there's many roads. They all go to the same place. Some believe in Allah, some believe in Buddha, some practice wicked, some do this, some do that. But all of us, if we really, really believe, that's what the new pope has said. If you really just believe, that's enough. Jesus said, I am the way. And, and if you believe in Christ as the way, you're going to profess that. And so the evidence is found in confession. But there's that second evidence we learned about it a moment ago. Look at verse 16 as we close. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And God in him. So we have the evidence of confession. And we have the evidence of love. It, it concerns me when a member of the body is not sure that they love the rest of the body. Look at God's not saying you're going to agree with the body all the time. You're not going to like it when your kid gets a C or doesn't get to play enough basketball or when someone takes your favorite parking spot or, God forbid, sits in your chair that you bought. Some of you, I can just see the rapture. Get me taking that chair up. There's a better one in heaven. I just want you to know that. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> Listen, no one says you have to like everything about everybody, but God says one of the real evidences of a believer is they love other believers. There's a lot of different strains of Christendom with which I disagree on certain theological or perhaps practical or principles, and they may do some things differently, but listen. Anybody that I meet on any part of this planet who believes that Jesus Christ is the perfectly sinless Son of God and they have turned to Him exclusively to be their Savior, I want to tell you something. I have a bond of love with them. I'll tell you, I was talking to some men this week who've been involved in Ukraine who have, who have placed Bibles in the majority of schools, public schools in Ukraine who have seen people saved. And some of those people might be in a little different type of a church. They might be in a Bible church or a Baptist Union church or some kind of this or that church. But if they have truly put their faith in Jesus Christ and if they confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you know, there ought to be some love in your heart for them. Amen. You ought to want to pray for them. Amen. And God says that the response of the believer to the manifestation of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit 
is number one, we're going to confess publicly. We're not going to be ashamed. Some of you ought to get home tonight and on your Facebook and on your social media, you ought to say, my name is Jim. I am a born again, Bible believing Christian. I have been saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I believe I'm heaven bound because of what Jesus has done for me. And oh yeah, I like Chevrolet and apple pie, but that doesn't compare with the fact that I'm a saved believer. And if you're ashamed to do that, there's a great concern, teenager, for your soul tonight. If you are unwilling to confess who Jesus is to you. By the way, I don't write it, I just recite it. And there, there are many times unsaved people in church, and that's why preachers preach sermons like this. Because we need to test our profession by the truth of the word of God. And let's see it once again, verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath given to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So the evidence tends to come around the theme tonight of the confession that is made and the love that is shown. Now notice in this final verse, we will love fellow believers because God's love is in us. Turn to one more verse if you would, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. As we think about loving one another, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, just a few pages back. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. In other words, this is a body, right? This is body. If a part of the body hurts, we should have compassion on one another. And, and we should all be of one mind in this. Notice, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called and that ye should inherit a blessing. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. It's not always easy to love your fellow believer. The Bible says, if at all possible, live peaceably with them. It's not always easy. It's, it's never fun to love somebody who doesn't love you back. It's kind of hard sometimes to Try to encourage someone that goes, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's, it's difficult to try to love somebody that won't come to church or doesn't seem to want your visit. But we are commanded to love them. Church, let's never stop loving these people. I remember years ago, Brother First, there was a family, and I can't remember their name right now. I probably wouldn't mention it, but they, they stopped coming to church they kind of were kind of ugly in their spirit about it. And uh, we tried to reach out a few times, and they were just kind of rude. Brother Furso just kind of kept that guy on his prayer list. And just kind of every so often would go by and say, hey, just want you to know we're still praying for you. We still love you. And there might be some people right now watching LBCLive.tv, and we still love you, and we miss you. And that's what Brother Furso would say. We miss you. And over a period of time, just because Brother Furso kept loving and loving. And I think, I don't think I ever said this to Brother Furso, but I probably thought to myself, you know, Brother Furso, you're probably wasting your time going by that guy's house. We, you know, we gotta, there's other places to go. <laughs> but he kept loving the guy and loving the guy. And that man and his wife came back to Lancaster Baptist Church some years later. They were here, I don't know, three, four years. They sang, they laughed, they served, they loved. They had a renaissance in their Christian life until he was killed in a motorcycle accident. But I thank God for people like Brother Furso that just keep loving and loving. Hey, if you see somebody this week that used to be in church, don't give them a judgmental stare. Don't, don't, don't go there. Sometimes people, sometimes people will see me. They don't see me at the mall because I don't go to the mall. Thank the Lord I don't go to the mall. <laughs> But they'll see me somewhere, maybe at In-N-Out Burger, <laughs> reading the verse on the bottom of the cup. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes they'll even put their eyes down to act like they didn't see me. Pastors see all this stuff. And when I see them fidgeting or like, oh, telling their someone, there he is, there he is, you know. <laughs> you know what I always do? I always go, hey! Man, how's it going? Boy, your kids have sure grown up. They, their kids might have earrings. Who knows what all's going on in those families? That's, look, at, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I want to show them God's love. 
It's not always easy. There have been some times in my life when I've been tempted just to kind of preach a sermon and just go home. You have times where you're not sure about something or something doesn't feel right or someone's hurt you. You've had times maybe where maybe a police officer hurt you so then the devil doesn't want you to love more police officers. Or maybe someone of a particular race hurt you so you don't want to love them anymore. Or maybe someone said something about you and you kind of want to write off people groups sometimes. That's, that's what the devil specializes in. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Years ago, I read a little something that helped me. Maybe it'll help you. People are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love them anyways. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Do good anyways. If you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyways. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyways. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyways. The biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men and women with the smallest minds sitting in their basement eating Cheerios on the internet. That wasn't in the original, but I added that later. <laughs> Think big anyways. People favor underdogs, but follow only top dogs. Fight for a few underdogs anyways. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyways. People really need help, but may attack you if you do help them. Help them anyways. Give the world the best you have, and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyways. Amen. I'm just saying that sometimes it's not comfortable to love. But loving is the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in you, and it is a testimony of God. I remember years ago, Brother Rasmussen, there was a preacher, and you know perhaps what I'm speaking about. He'd been extremely unkind to me. Church never knew it. Deacons never knew it. No one ever knew it. He'd been extremely unkind to me. And uh, had said false things, had a spirit of jealousy, had written letters and articles, and just ridiculous. And... Um, I just kind of gave that one over to the Lord, one of those things I thought, well, this will have to get figured out in heaven because I can't figure it out. And some years ago, another pastor died, and I told Brother Rasmussen, go with me to the funeral. And we went to the funeral, and uh, we were standing in this line, going to go by the casket, and there was the other preacher, the one that had been so unkind, the one that I'd helped so much financially, counseling, Hundreds and hundreds of hours I'd helped him, and only to be mistreated. Dr. R and I, and I said, hey, Brother Rasmussen, look at there's so-and-so. I said, hold my place in line. I'm going to go talk to him. And I went up. I tapped on his shoulder. He looked at me. You would have thought he saw a ghost. <laughs> I put my arm around him. Hey, how you doing? I just squeezed him. I didn't let go. He couldn't do anything. It was a funeral. Just held on to him. I said, hey, after this, let's go get a meal. He, he couldn't even speak to me. He just said, like that. We took him for a meal. Sat there with him. I said, you know, I've sure missed you. Just want you to know we sure love you. You and your family mean a lot to us. I remember Dr. Rasmussen saying, I can't believe you did that. By the way, I think he sent 20 or 30 students to West Coast Baptist College. I, I think his family got along a whole lot better having been restored to someone that cared for them. Sometimes it's easier just to write people off. And there may be some times when you, they're not going to be the people you spend the most time with. But one of the evidences of God in you is that you can love people the way God loves them. And let us always be a loving church. And let us always love the unsaved. Let us have the heart of God in this matter. The Son of Man has come to seek 
and to save that which was lost. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Sometimes somebody might come even into church and they're just, they're all, they're a mess. They're disheveled. They don't look right. They don't smell right. They don't act right. Appreciate a couple of the ushers this morning politely asking a couple men to take off their ball caps. I appreciated that. I, I know it's old school. I don't want to offend anybody. I just, I don't like ball caps in church. But you did it in a nice way. And I saw some of our people go and sit with that fellow, and they tried to get him to come down the aisle, and they loved on him and encouraged him. And I'm just saying that, that we can't look at people that aren't there yet. If they're not even saved, how are they going to be there yet? We need to love them where they are. Romans 5, 6, but when ye were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm simply saying tonight, the, the, the revelation of God through Christ, the indwelling of God through the Spirit should make all the difference in my life so that I am not ashamed to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is my Savior. And it should help me to love people the way that God loves them. For the Bible says in Matthew 7, 20, whereby, wherefore by their fruits you will know them. People ought to be able to say, I don't understand everything about those Baptists. They go to church so much. They build those big buildings. They run those buses. They're always giving me those papers. I don't understand all that, but I'll tell you one thing about those people. They're the kindest people I've ever met. They're always, they're always so kind to me. They're very loving people. They seem to care for one another. We have many leaders in this city. They're far from saved, but they know that Lancaster Baptist Church is a salt and light presence in this city. The last thing they want, though they may never admit it, is for this church to not be here in this city because the love of God is present in this city because of this church. And may it always be so until Jesus comes.